Hello and welcome to a short video in this introduction to SOLIDWORKS simulation, finite element analysis. In this uh, video I'm going to run through the first exercise, exercise 1, where we'll just uh, model a bar in tension. Okay, so I've gone ahead in SOLIDWORKS and I've opened up a new part file. First thing I'm going to do before I model anything is I'm going to save this file. Um, and I'm going to save it in particular into uh, its own subfolder. So I'm going to I've created a folder for all my simulations and I'm saving uh, the part into its own folder, exercise 1. I'll give it a name, exercise 1, uh, bar tension, something like that. Something that you'll, you'll remember later. Okay, it's important to save the, the part into its own subfolder because when we run the simulation, SolidWorks will generate a number of files, maybe somewhere between 10 and 15 files, and it'll place all those files in the same location that you've saved your part file. So uh, get into the habit of creating a subfolder for each exercise. Okay. Now, um, so in the new part, I'm going to create the geometry. It's very, very simple geometry. I'm going to create an extrusion perpendicular to the right plane so that the axis of the bar will be running in the x direction. I'm just going to simply create an extrusion. I'm going to draw a rectangle and dimension that 10, 10 millimeters across by 20 millimeters in height. And I'm going to extrude that out by a length of 200 millimeters. Okay, that's the geometry done, created. Um, at this stage, I, I'm in the habit of adding the material properties at this stage, but you can do that later on in the simulation study either. So I'm going to right click here, go to edit material, and I'm going to assign the material properties of alloy steel to the model here. So that'll tell the software what the Young's modulus of the material is, Poisson's ratio, the shear modulus, density, tensile strength to yield strength, etc. for that material R. Okay, apply that and close. Okay, so that's the model done and completed. It's a very simple geometry, as I said. It's just a rectangular bar, 10 by 20, and we've given it some material properties of alloy steel here. So next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the simulation tab, and I'm going to create a new simulation study. This should be visible by default. If it's not visible, you may need to go to the add-ins section up here, and you may need to enable the SOLIDWORKS simulation add-in. Okay, anyway, go to the simulation tab and we're going to create a new study. There's lots of different types of studies you can create within SOLIDWORKS simulation. Initially, we're going to look at uh, just the static simulations. Later on, we'll be doing frequency analyses and maybe linear dynamic, but for now, we we'll just do a static simulation. So this simulates what would happen if you put a constant force or a constant torque or some kind of load on the part, how, uh, what kind of stresses and strains will be developed. So create a new static uh, simulation study. You can give it a name if you wish, and then click OK. And you'll see that creates a tab down here at the bottom. You can have multiple studies uh, concurrently on the same part. We're going to start with one and we might refine that later with a second or third study. Okay, so within the study then we have this feature tree on the left hand side. We also have a number of commands up on the ribbon. Um, these are essentially duplicates of each other. You can Most of the things that we're going to do, you can either do them by say right clicking on the feature tree here or using these drop down menus up here. I tend to work kind of from the feature tree here going from top to bottom. So the first level here, we can do things like run the study. <clears throat> we can change some study <clears throat> study properties, options, that kind of thing here. Uh, the next option here is, we'll talk in more detail in further exercises, but one of the things you can do here is to apply the material properties at that stage. So if you haven't already, then go ahead and apply the properties of alloy steel here. The next section here, connections, really only applies if you have more than one part or more than one body. 
um, you define how they're connected to each other. Are they rigidly joined together or can they slide relative to each other? That kind of thing. The next section here, fixtures, and the one after that, loads. Um, the two of these define how the model is loaded. So if we want to place this bar in tension, what we're going to have to do is hold one end of the part fixed in place and apply a force to the other end of it. The, that then will cause the, the bar to stretch out in tension. So I'll do that um, maybe in order here. And what I'll do is I'll apply the simplest type of fixture first. I'm going to apply what's called a fixed geometry fixture to this back surface and I'll explain more about that in a moment. So the left hand side or the negative x side of the bar I'm going to apply a fixed, fixed geometry fixture. So applying a fixed geometry to face one. Okay, so that Effectively, that end of the bar will be held rigidly in place. On the right-hand side, or the positive X side of the bar, I'm going to apply an external load here. So I can right-click on that. I can apply forces, torques, pressure, gravi gravitational loads, centrifugal loads, bearing loads, change in temperature, or um, move it by a certain distance here. So I'm going to apply a force on this phase here. So I'm applying a force to this phase. By default it goes in as a normal or a perpendicular force um, and it usually goes in as perpendicular in towards the face but I can reverse the direction there so it's going perpendicular out. If I wanted it to run in a different direction I can use the selected direction and pick some geometry from the model or from my, pl my front plane, top plane, right plane. I can pick some geometry to select a direction. In this case, normal is fine. I want it to be going normal, but I want to reverse the direction so that it's going normal outwards. And I'll give it a magnitude of 1,000 newtons. Okay. So our model, when we run it, will be held rigidly in place on the left-hand side, and we've got an outwards tensile force of 1,000 newtons on the right-hand side here. The next option here down in this list is the mesh, and this is really the the meat of how finite element analysis works. You, you take your model, in this case a relatively simple 10 by 20 rectangular bar, and you subdivide that up into a mesh of elements. So if I right click on that and go to create mesh here, I get some options as to how um, I'm going to split this single solid body up into thousands of smaller elements. So what I'll do is I'll just use the default parameters first. Um, the default parameters, what, what it's actually going to do, it has a target size. It's going to divide this up into tetrahedral elements with a target size of about 3.4 millimeters uh, each. So if I just click OK, it runs through an algorithm as to how it maps those elements onto, the, onto our solid model. And you can see it's divided it up into these tetrahedra. Okay, so three-dimensional triangles, essentially. All right. Um, now, the default parameters with a target size of about 3.4, you get about three elements across the thickness of that 10 millimeters. If I right-click on Mesh again and go to Mesh Details here, you can see that I've got 8,837 tetrahedral elements, um, and we've got 14,282 nodes. Now what the nodes are, they're essentially they're kind of the points of the triangles. So this uh, intersection here between all these different triangles is a node. You've also got a node, and in this particular type of element, these also have what are called midpoint nodes. So there'll be another node halfway along this edge of this triangle, and another node here where all these triangles meet. The way the finite element analysis works is it Effectively, it works out the strain or the, the change in length between pairs of nodes when it runs the simulation. So the nodes are really the important part of the mesh. So in this case, we've got 14,282 nodes in this model. Now, if I was to go back and mesh that, say if I go with a slightly finer mesh, meaning I have slightly smaller triangles, we might have a lot more. So if I, say, go to about 2 millimeter edge length, I should have approximately 5 across the, the width here, and I should have maybe 10 across the height, and maybe 100 along the length of it. So if I remesh that with 
a two, roughly two millimeter edge length, you'll see I get many, many more tetrahedra, and therefore lots and lots more nodes. So I can check the mesh details on that. Now I've got uh, 39,700 elements and 59,700 nodes. So even a relatively small change in the edge length gives you a much bigger or much larger number of no, uh, elements and nodes. Okay. In general, as a rule of thumb, the more elements you have, the more precise and probably the more accurate your results will be. But there's sort of diminishing returns. If you go beyond a certain number of elements, you don't get any extra increase in um, accuracy or in, in precision. But you wind up with larger file sizes and it takes more RAM and more processing power to run the simulation. Um, in this particular case, we'll, the, the default parameter size would be fine. So we'll leave it here in the middle somewhere. It was about 3.4, I believe. About there. And about 8,000 elements. Should be more than enough for this very simple model. Okay, so that, that's the simulation set up and ready to run. We have it fixed in place on the left hand side. We've applied a force on the right hand side. We've split the model up into a mesh of elements and those elements are composed of nodes. Now just another little note on this um, fixed geometry fixture that I applied to the left hand side here. What the fixed geometry fixture does is it takes all of the nodes on the left hand side of the part here and it fixes them completely in place in six degrees of freedom. So the six degrees of freedom would be three movements, or three translations, movement in the X, Y, Z directions. Uh, that's three degrees of freedom. And the other three would be three rotations about the X axis, rotating about the Y axis, and rotating about the Z axis. So this left-hand side of the bar cannot move at all. It can't move in the X, Y, or Z directions. Okay, that's what the fixed geometry fixture does. Now, I think this is ready to run now. I'm gonna go up to the top here and click on run, or I could uh, right click here and click on run. Okay, it's a very simple model. It should run quite quickly. And um, you see what we get then is, by default, SolidWorks will put in three sets of results here. It'll put in a stress plot. So a plot of all the stresses in the part. A displacement plot, the resultant displacement, so for each node in the part, how far has it moved from where it was initially. So this is the, the bar before the force has been applied. If I click on the formed result up here at the top, this is the part after the force has been applied. Okay, so there's the initial end of the bar and there's the deformed shape of the bar. Now, it's worth noting that that is very much exaggerated. It's exaggerated by a deformation scale of 4,208. Um, just so that it's more easily visible or more easily easy to view in the results. Um, one thing I like to do is to go to the chart settings. So right click on any one of these charts and go to chart settings. And you can check a box here to superimpose the model on the deformed shape. Okay, I'll just do that again and set the transparency a little bit lower, about 0 0.6 should be fine. And hopefully you can see then that the this is the original shape of the of the bar, this light gray kind of ghost image. And then the solid here is the final deformed shape of the bar. Okay. So the bar, when we apply our 1000 newtons of force, it gets longer in the X direction, but hopefully you can see here as well that it also gets narrower in the Y direction and it gets narrower in the Z direction as well. Okay, so that's called transverse strain. So when, when an object gets longer in one dimension, say the X direction here, to compensate for that, it has to get narrower in the Y and Z directions. Okay, so that's the change in length. One thing worth noting is that because we've used the fixed geometry fixture back here, the part is not allowed to get narrower in the Y or Z directions, and that can lead to some um, issues with uh, the stress results at that location. Okay, so if we look at the stress results, maybe for most of the bar, it's under a fairly uniform stress. That would be just stress is equal to force divided by area. 
is 5 megapascals, I think we worked out in class. Um, you can look at that if you right click on the legend here on the right hand side, or if you right click on the stress plot here itself, you can get this probe tool. Now we can look at any particular node, and I might just, I'll, I'll uh, right click on the legend here actually and just overlay the mesh on top of that. Just to show you that what, when we look at these results, we're actually looking at the results for a particular node. Okay, any other results in between, uh, not actually on a node, will be just interpolated from the node values all around it. You can't get the actual result in the middle of this face of this triangle. You can only get a result from a node, either at the corner of a triangle, the vertex, or at the midpoint of a side. Okay, anyway, um, the results all the way along the bar here are a fairly uniform five megapascals, except for at the corners back here. And that would be because uh, it's not allowed to strain in the transverse direction. So we go to chart settings again. And um, you can see that for most of the bar, it's allowed to get narrower in the Y and Z directions. But here at the corners, it hasn't been allowed to get narrower. So that's that kind of leads to uh, excess of stress at the corners. Okay, so that is, um, I suppose that is more or less it for exercise one. Uh, when we were doing this in class, we did a, a separate way of, of um, fixing that, maybe a more nuanced way of applying fixtures to the back end. I might do that in a separate video. Um, yeah, so we looked at our displacement results, and again, those that's the resultant displacement of each node. So each node in the part, it works out the displacement of that node relative to where it was initially. So before the force was applied, and after the force was applied, after the force is applied, it works out the distance between those two. Um, the, oh yeah, the stress plot here. So the, the default stress plot within SOLIDWORKS is what's called von Mises stress. Um, now that's not, at, at third year in mechanical engineering, you may or may not have, have studied what von Mises stress is. Uh, say the, some, of, some of the mechanical groups will have studied that and some of you won't. Um, maybe to demonstrate that, uh, let me see. To demonstrate that, I'm going to look at a, a different model. So this is a, a model of a bar that you that has been placed in uh, tension. So very similar to, to what we've looked at before. I've done one study where I placed the bar in tension. I've done another study placing the bar in torsion. So that develops kind of torsional shear stresses within the bar. And then I've done a third study where the bar is both in tension and torsion at the same time. So we wind up with a more complex um, stresses on, on the bar. The stresses are not just running straight axially. There's shear stresses, there's axial stresses and a combination of the two. If we look at von Mises stress for, um, for that system, for this bar, it gives us a contour plot and tells us the stresses are kind of running between three megapascals and six and a half megapascals. Um, if you were to take a cut and look internally at the bar, you'll see there's kind of low stresses at about three megapascals internally in the bar, and that's probably mostly tension. And you have up to kind of five, six megapascals on the outer surface. That's probably a combination of the tension plus the torsional shear stresses. But what von Mises stress just gives us a single number for the stress at that location. It doesn't tell us whether it's a shear stress or a ten tensile stress or a compressive stress or anything like that. Um, so von Mises stress is a useful tool, but you, to understand what, it, what von Mises stress is, it, it really takes all of the stresses at a particular location and it combines them all into a single number that's always a positive number, okay? It doesn't tell you the direction or the um, 
you know, what type of stress it is. So to demonstrate that, what, what I have done here is to look at von Mises' stress as a vector plot, or a tensor plot, technically. So what did von Mises stress here, say if I take some location on the outer surface of the of the bar, so this is just on the outer outer surface of that round bar. What von Mises stress does is it calculates uh, what are called the principal stresses within the bar. So in this case, the maximum tensile stress on the outer surface of that bar is running at some angle. It looks like approximately 45 degrees to the axis of the bar. You have this tensile stress going that way. At 90 degrees, so that's called the first principal stress. At 90 degrees to the first principal stress, you have this other stress running uh, compressive. So it's a compressive stress, kind of 45 degrees the other way. And there would be a third stress running perpendicular to those two again, but it's, it's probably so small that it's negligible. You can't actually see it there on the outer surface of the bar. If we were to look at a, a node somewhere in the middle of the bar, maybe you might just see uh, here, this one for example, the first principal stress is running this way, it's a tensile stress, you have a compressive stress running that way, and then you have a smaller tensile stress running perpendicular to that again. So those are the three principal stresses within a bar, and depending on the location that you look at, they may be running in different directions, they may be um, different magnitudes, tensile, compressive, whatever it happens to be. What von Mises stress does is it takes all of those stresses and applies a formula to calculate a single number representing that stress state at that location. Okay, so that von Mises stress, if you, uh, let's say we look at the cut here. So von Mises stress at a particular node Um, let's say if we look at a node here, that's taking the first, second and third principal stresses and also maybe the shear stresses, the maximum shear stress at that location and it combines them all to give you a single number of 3.4, uh, sorry, 34 megapascals. Uh, excuse me, sorry, it's 65 megapascals, not 6.5. Uh, at this location here, it's 34 megapascals. Okay. So that's what von Mises stress is. Um, going back to our exercise one here. As I said, the default stress value that SolidWorks uses is von Mises stress. In this case, that happens to be more or less the same as the axial stress in the part because it's a very simple loading conditions on this here. Um, you could also, you can define any amount of different different results plots. We could define a new stress plot here. And instead of looking at von Mises stress, we could look specifically at the axial normal stress, the sigma x or sx here. And you, you should see that's roughly the same value. That should be 5 megapascals, 5 megapascals, 5 megapascals. Uh, except for at these these corners where that fixture is giving us some strange results. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's that's the sigma x, the normal stress. You can also, if you right click on your legend over here, you can flip between those different stresses. So the x normal stress, the y normal stress, the z normal stress. Shear stresses, principal stresses, von Mises stress, and a few other ones as well. Um, yeah, so what you would be typically used to calculating stress is equal to force over area. That would be this one, the axial normal stress. Here. Okay, I think this video has gone on long enough. I might stop it at that, and uh, I might do an update about doing different... Um, as a more nuanced way of applying fixtures to this.